Welcome to the Fountains Studio Celebration. If you're a regular viewer, you know that every week we have a rotating group of volunteers who serve as readers leading us through each studio. And we're grateful for Denise Rajeski for faithfully assigning volunteers each month. Going forward, we're going to try a new sign-up method using the Sign Up Genius app. This way, volunteers can choose their own dates for helping out. Look in the description below for a link to Sign Up Genius, and once you're there, just scroll to the Studio Reader tab and select the date or dates you're available to read. Then scroll to the bottom, click on Save, and Bob's your uncle. The app will send you a reminder when your week is coming up. If you'd like to, you can select dates several months in advance. We trust this will be a convenient way for everyone to take part in helping make the studio happen for all of us. If you have any questions, please let us know by emailing welcome at weputlovefirst.org. In the meantime, from wherever and whenever you're joining us, we're glad you're here. Join us as we get in the Spirit. Surprising God, you come to our lives in ways we do not expect. We ask for success. You teach acceptance. We ask to be loved. You ask us to love. We ask for ease. You challenge us. We ask for a triumphant Messiah. You come as one obedient to death. We glorify the winner. You glorify the loser who died on a criminal's cross. Walk among us, surprising God of peace. Be present in our time of celebration. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
let's affirm the fountain's mission together. As followers of Jesus, we, we put, put love, love first. first. Today is Palm Sunday. We remember the story of crowds cheering and shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. In one gospel, they wave palm branches. In another, they spread their garments and leafy branches along the way as Jesus entered Jerusalem. But the cheers were shallow and the celebration short-lived. The cheers held back the inevitable only briefly. Jesus' revolutionary message was too much to bear for those in charge of the status quo. Like countless other zealots and troublemakers, Jesus had to be dealt with. And by the end of the week, Jesus would be publicly executed. Today, only one candle remains lit. Jesus said, the light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness may not overtake you. As we come to this time of quiet and openness, may we breathe deep. Still the chatter in our minds and open ourselves to the nearness of the source of life. We breathe in a rhythm that connects us with all of life. And in the quiet, we long for our souls to be at rest. In the quiet, may we sense the presentness of the Spirit in us, around us, and in all times and places. May we be grateful for an awareness of the gift of life, and may our hearts and minds be open. Be Of all times and places, we confess that we would rather join the crowds than stand alone. We prefer the popular point of view to a solitary witness for justice and truth. We like safety and security while shrinking from the risk of involvement. We sing Hosanna when everyone else is doing so, but not when the hostile Good Friday forces may hear us. We do not like to admit our lukewarm response to you, but neither do we want to be considered fanatics. Be patient with us, God. 
Strengthen us to not be anxious or run away from your call on our lives, even when events on the horizon seem ominous. Remind us that you'll be with us in every part of life. This is our prayer. We offer this time of quiet, bringing our whole selves in the name of the one who taught his first followers to pray the prayer we now sing together. Hey there, Fountains folk. You don't need me to tell you that there's a lot of excitement at the Fountains around all the ways that we're keeping up the momentum in putting love first in the world. That's right, Beth. We've not only seen growth in engagement, in connecting with the needs of real people, we continue to be a witness in Fountain Hills for a way of following Jesus that people are not only hungry for, but without us, many people wouldn't even know existed. I think we all know that you'd be hard pressed to find the message and welcome that the Fountains offers just anywhere. And that's why it's extra important to invest in our collective efforts to keep impacting the community. So today is an important day in our special one year capital campaign that will clear our mortgage, revitalize our campus and free us to do even more. Our target, 200,000 above and beyond our usual giving by the end of 2024. This will unleash even more potential for the Fountain's impact on our community. Imagine paying off the Connection Center mortgage, enhancing our audio visual capabilities, increasing security and making vital repairs, all supporting our various and growing community activities. Here's the important part. Your pledge card is key to joining this vital effort. Whether it's a one-off donation or spread throughout the rest of 2024, your generous gift will help propel us toward our goal. So today is the day we all join together in bringing our pledge cards so we can be a part of the big reveal on Easter Sunday. And in the end, it's not about the total funds pledged, it's a statement about our collective commitment to supporting the mission and the values of the Fountains. So to both our studio and in-person members, thank you in advance for your participation and generosity. Together, we can keep up the momentum and show what putting love first in the world truly means. Remember, every pledge counts towards our Easter reveal. Either get your pledge card in our Palm Sunday or soon after, or make your donation to keeping up the momentum on our secure giving site, give.weputlovefirst.org. Together, we're not only making a statement about what's important to us, we're investing in the future and changing the lives of real people here and now. Thanks for putting love first and being part of keeping up the momentum here at the Fountains. Yay, Beth! <laughs> Ha <laughs> <laughs>
At the fountains, we are agents of change. We know that it's not enough to just believe, so we take action. We strive to work together as followers of Jesus to be there for one another and find creative ways to make the world a more just and peaceful place. So as we gather both virtually and in person, we hope you take the initiative to support the fountains financially. To make an online donation, you can either go to give.weputlovefirst.org or you can press the Donate Here button on the Fountains homepage, weputlovefirst.org. You can also download the Vanco mobile app. Search for the Fountains and follow the instructions or you can open the camera app on your phone or tablet and point it at the QR code on the screen. Both will take you to our secure giving page. And of course, you can always send a check. The Fountains continues to be a catalyst of putting love first in our community and beyond. May we give with joy, confident that we are taking part in living out Jesus' call in our lives. Thank you for your support.
The book of Proverbs is a compendium of metaphor and short sayings that was compiled maybe 2,500 years ago, right after the Jews returned from their exile in Babylon. And although it's often been claimed to have been written by King Solomon to add some authority, it's actually five different sections that are pretty obvious to the careful reader. Um, they all come from different places, the fourth of which is actually modeled on an older Egyptian text, the instruction of Amen M. Ope. The whole goal was to encourage the student to acquire a personal standard of values and practical know-how in this crazy world. It's part of the wisdom literature because, as you'll hear in our passage, it appeals to the student to open up to wisdom, for it is only in so doing that we can truly be whole human beings. Our words of wisdom are from Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 13. If anyone respects and fears God, they will hate evil, for wisdom hates pride, arrogance, corruption, and deceit of every kind. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. After the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70, they struck a coin celebrating the destruction of the Jews, Judea Capta. And to represent Judea, they used a palm tree. Why? Because a generation before, an independent Judea minted coins themselves that used a palm tree to represent a free Judea. So here we are on Palm Sunday, and in the Gospel of John, at least, we have crowds waving an incendiary political symbol, palm branches, the symbols of a free Judea, right under the noses of some very twitchy Roman shock troops. Imagine a group of Palestinians marching through the old city of Jerusalem this weekend, waving Palestinian flags right under the noses of nervous Israeli defense forces, and you start to get the idea. For John, this is no simple celebratory parade. This is intentional provocation. If you read Mark and Matthew, there's no palm waving at all, just leafy branches strewn on the road. For Luke, there are no palms, no branches, no nothing. Palms only come into play in the very last gospel, John. Why? Because John is like a writer for the New York Post. He likes to exaggerate things to punch up the story, sensationalizing details into an in-your-face kind of event. Were palms waved on the first Palm Sunday? N not if you go with the evidence of the earliest Gospels, but John likes to poke the bear. If a parade into Jerusalem actually did happen historically, would have probably been a much more low-key event. Because oppressed people shouting, Hosanna, save us, to the potential leader of an opposition party alone, that, that would have made the authorities nervous. But no, John had to go and amp things up to not only bring the crisis to a head, but, I think, to make the response of the people during Holy Week even more perplexing. And what is the response of the people? From Palm Sunday to Good Friday, the people go from shouting approval of Jesus and the possibility of political liberation to wholeheartedly joining in the call for Jesus' execution, all in the course of a couple of days. And why? I think it's human nature. It was easier. People know oppression when they see it. People know exploitation when they experience it. People recognize injustice when it's staring them in the face. But when it comes right down to it, we'd much rather have someone else deal with it than get involved ourselves. The crowds who cheered Jesus on during his entry into Jerusalem were ecstatic at the prospect that oppression 
might be ended and justice might be done, just so long as somebody else did it. But turns out Jesus wasn't a wave a magic wand and magically make all things right kind of guy. He told people what was necessary for oppression to end and justice to be done. And it was simple to follow his lead in coming together and making it happen. And the people responded with a resounding, no thank you. They even went so far as to join in calling for the death of the one who had the audacity to suggest that they should get involved. Forget it! Too dangerous, too inconvenient. I mean, <laughs> the devil you know is better than the devil we don't, right? And that's why it's good we keep telling this story, because it's a cautionary tale about human nature. The crowd's not stupid. They know what needs to happen. Just like our Proverbs passage today, they hate evil. They see it in the pride, arrogance, corruption, and deceit of those who are oppressing them and others. But the cost of standing up to those forces is just too much. You see what they did to Jesus? No, thank you. And herein lies our challenge for today. Nothing has changed. We see the evil, the pride, arrogance, corruption, and deceit of those who are oppressing others. We're not stupid. We know what needs to happen. But the cost of standing up to those forces is just too much. We would much rather spend all our energy praising Jesus for his sacrifice than join him in his work. Instead of being people of the way and practicing the gospel of Jesus. Most conventional Christians obsess over the gospel about Jesus. Why? Because it lets us be cheerleaders for someone else having done the hard work and just lets us off the hook. Evil just exists. Suffering exists. Injustice exists. What do you expect me to do about it? I'm just one person. Well, that's the theme of one of the hardest Kurt Struckmeyer chapters that I've read. Hard because it's 40 pages of detailed examples of how religious people in general and conventional Christians in particular have been complicit in centuries of injustice, oppression, and downright evil. And the vast majority of folks just go along with it. Like those Palm Sunday crowds shouting, save us, save us. Christians know oppression and injustice when they see it and experience it. But the expectation that they do anything about it themselves is just too big of an ask. If, if you haven't already picked up a copy of Kurt Struckmeyer's book, The People of the Way, to follow along with this message series, I encourage you to do so. And while this chapter the banality of evil is hard to read. It's also really important. In it, Kurt details a laundry list of everyday evil, much of which we take for granted, be it the serial killings and mass shootings that are now almost daily events to the genocides of Hitler, Stalin, and Pol Pot reaching death tolls of unfathomable magnitudes, to today's out-of-control killing and starvation of innocent Palestinians in Gaza. When trying to make sense of the horrors of the Holocaust and the actions or inactions of everyday people in Nazi-era Germany, philosopher and political theorist Hannah Arendt identified two kinds of evil. Radical evil is everything from the kind of evil done one-on-one -on -one by sociopaths to the kind of evil that is established and carried out by societies who have normalized brutality and injustice. But the second kind she called banal evil. The noun banality refers to something that is typically ordinary, commonplace, familiar, and unexceptional. It's the kind of evil that in the end we are all culpable with. 
as Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. If we're honest, we can make a list of all the ways seemingly good people in America and in all other countries are regularly complicit with evil, evil acts, evil policies, evil laws, evil systems, and evil events. It's no wonder so many politicians are seeking to repress what our children are being taught in history class, from slavery to Jim Crow to the genocide of Native Americans and the expropriation of their land, lynchings and race riots like the Tulsa Massacre of 1921, continued racial discrimination in jobs, housing, education, and politics, police bias, race-driven mass incarceration in our prisons, immigration policies that punish non-Northern European Christians, rampant anti-Semitism in every industry and institution, the unconstitutional and inhumane internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, the continued dehumanizing and subjugation of women, the discrimination against LGBTQ plus people, not to mention our government's overthrow of multiple other countries and our own country's assassination of foreign leaders and the growing knowledge of our having tested drugs and diseases on unsuspecting American citizens without their consent. Need I go on? It's exhausting. And if we as Americans committed ourselves to an honest conversation about our history, it might cause us to rethink the dominant narrative of our perfection as a country and initiate change going forward. But most Americans never question the domination systems that shape our culture. And despite many people's claim that we're a Christian nation, there's a notable lack of introspection, empathy, and compassion that you'd think would come along with that identity. Baptist preacher and theologian Clarence Jordan wrote, we must be really grieved that things are as they are. Those people are not real mourners who say, sure, the world is a mess, and I guess maybe I'm a bit guilty like everybody else, but what can I do about it? What they're really saying is that they are not concerned enough about themselves or the world to look for anything to do. No great burden hangs on their hearts. They aren't grieved. They don't mourn. So here's the challenge. Are we going to be like those Palm Sunday crowds, whipped up into a temporary enthusiasm for making things right, only to have second thoughts when faced with the work it's going to take? Or are we able to muster the ethical introspection and empathy towards others that melts our indifference toward the fate of others and take up Jesus' call to change the world? Conventional Christian practitioners of the gospel about Jesus have made religion into a hyper-spiritualized and hyper-personal exercise that focuses first and foremost on one's own salvation. Outside of your basic acts of charity here and there, the bad stuff going on out in the world, that, that's, that's not my responsibility. But the gospel that Jesus practiced himself was about engagement with the big issues in life and how we treat one another in community. Because they saw the promise of what Jesus had to offer those Palm Sunday crowds were excited, but only until they realized the implications of Jesus' call on their personal lives. Then they either quietly 
melted away, or became part of the crowd calling for the execution, the troublemaker. The Greek word for evil is kakos. It's where we get the word cacophony. It suggests a lack of something, of being not quite whole. And if you haven't noticed, the world we live in is anything but whole. And our Proverbs passage today is a direct response to that reality, saying, if anyone respects and fears God, they will hate evil. And, and if you don't like the word hate, go with have a strong aversion to evil. Because wisdom, a primary goal of people of the way, has a strong aversion to pride, arrogance, corruption, and deceit of every kind. But not the kind of aversion that causes us to turn away in fear and apathy. It's the kind of aversion that demands a response. As Robert McAfee Brown wrote, Whatever the status of evil in the world, I know that the only God in whom I can believe will be a God found in the midst of evil, rather than at a safe distance from it. In the midst of it, not just waving a palm branch and counting on someone else to do the heavy lifting. It's a kind of commitment that not only recognizes the superficial for what it is, but is willing to go beyond that then, to be totally engaged. Once upon a time, there was a little farm boy who lived miles from the nearest town. One day he was in town running errands with his folks when he saw a poster announcing a traveling circus coming to town the next weekend. Well, he, he'd never seen a circus before, and he could barely contain his excitement. Daddy, can I go? Even though the family was poor, his father saw how important this was to the boy and said, if you get your Saturday chores done ahead of time, I'll see to it that you have the money to go. Well, come Saturday morning, the chores were all done, and the little boy came downstairs dressed in his Sunday best. His father handed him a single dollar bill, the most money the boy had ever had at one time his whole life. The father cautioned him to be careful and sent him on his way to walk to town. The boy was so excited, his feet hardly seemed to touch the ground the whole way. When he got there, people were lining Main Street, so he worked his way through the crowd until he could get to the front and see what was going on. And there, lo and behold, right before his eyes, passed the spectacle of the circus parade. It was the most exciting thing the boy had ever seen. There was a band. There were exotic animals in cages. There were acrobats, a calliope, and even a family of elephants lumbering down the street. And finally, after everything else had passed, came the clowns with floppy shoes and baggy pants and brightly painted faces. As one of the last clowns passed by where the boy was standing, he reached into his pocket and handed the clown his precious dollar bill. And with that, the boy made his way back home. Well, arriving home, the boy excitedly told his father all that had happened. Heartsick, the father couldn't bring himself to tell the delighted boy that what he thought was the circus was actually only the parade. Friends, the irony for many followers of Jesus is they're so caught up by the spectacle of the parade, they never get around to experiencing the main event. They're so focused on the superficial pursuit of their own salvation, they miss the deep engagement with the bigger picture. They miss the forest for the trees or mistake the parade for the circus. The people of that first Palm Sunday loved themselves a good parade but they weren't ready for the whole show. Does that make them evil? Nah, it makes them human beings caught up in the normalcy of civilization. The question for us is, 
Are we going to follow in their footsteps? Too busy or unaware to push back against the arrogance, corruption, and deceit of the world? Or will we let Jesus fine-tune our sensibilities enough to not be satisfied with letting the world stay the way it is? Friends, we've been called to be people of the way, and each of us along that way is the embodiment of our choices for the good and the not good. And as we strive to be followers of Jesus, may we know enough to not be distracted by or simply satisfied with the parade alone. May we commit to not letting apathy, unawareness, and the banality of evil be our legacy, but dedicate ourselves as catalysts for the emergence of life, love, and the good that we know is possible in the world. Be well. Summoned by the God who made us rich in our diversity, gathered in the name of Jesus, richer still in unity. Let us bring the gifts that differ and in splendid varied ways. Sing a new church into being, one of faith and love and praise. Trust the goodness of creation, trust the Spirit strong within, there to dream the vision promised from the seed of what has been. Let us bring the gifts that differ and in splendid varied ways sing a new church into being one of faith and love and praise bring the hopes of every nation bring the art of every race weave a song of peace and justice let it sound through time and space let us Join me in these words of challenge and blessing as we go. Whenever we are serving a noble and unpopular cause with selfless devotion, holding to the ideals of truth and justice. That is Palm Sunday. Whenever we are seeking to uplift the fallen, to comfort the brokenhearted, to strengthen and encourage the weak and hopeless. That is Palm Sunday. Whenever we are working bravely, and persistently in the face of abuse and criticism to establish more equitable relations in the world. That is Palm Sunday. Whenever we are sacrificing our lives on, in behalf of what we believe to be the service of love for all humanity. That is Palm Sunday. Go in peace.